and welcome to another episode of Double Tap. Today we are joined by Kix, um, who is co-founder and CEO of Tilt Yard. Um, they are crypto gaming OGs, uh, started off with Crypto Raiders and now building Midnight Heist, a high stakes strategy card game. Kix, my brother, how are you? Great. Hard zoom kicks right now. Uh, if I could zoom out a little bit, I would. Uh, but you're just going to get a lot of forehead in this podcast. Yeah, I, I love it. It's great. Um, before we get straight into the show, uh, disclaimers out of the way. So um, the, this content uh, should be strictly viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Um, it is not financial advice. The views shared by Alex and I are our own, and we may uh, have investments in some of the digital assets or companies discussed throughout the show. Kixer, what games are you currently playing? Great question, man. Uh, popular one, most people know, Team Fight Tactics. That's my jam. Actually, a lot of like inspiration for the things we're trying to build with like Midnight Heist and similar games come from Team Fight Tactics. They just came out with a big new patch. I've been playing it. A little bit of a niche game that I played a decent amount recently is called Mecha Bellum, dude. It's like mm. this like top down like mech army based auto battler where like your opponent has a board, you have a board, and every round you get like more money to buy different like army mech. You know you have, and they all have counters, right? You have like tanks, you have like aerial, you have like giants and mini units. Um, that's been a lot of fun. That's like that's like my indie game right now. I think Mechabellum is fantastic. Did you play Desert Strike at all? Are you familiar with that game? I did not, but like that's kind of in the same lane. Desert Strike, if I remember correctly, uh, is a mod from StarCraft, which inspired okay, cool. Mechabellum. And it's like very similar loop. And I like- Every good game from a mod, man. I Genre, know, whatever yes. you want to say. Yeah, Mechabellum was so good. I was crushing it. I crushed it. I forget when, maybe like at some point last year, I think it was like the game I played for like three weeks. Um, and it's great. It's like 10 minute games, you know, like great yeah. loop. And you can play 2v2, right? I, th I, I haven't done that yet. Cool. Maybe you can be my friend. You can come in there with me. All right, let's go. What's, uh, but while we're on it, what's, what's your rank for TFT? My buddy just hit like Emerald last night and he like mic dropped. He's like, I'm, I'm not never playing this game again. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. I'm like, a, I'm like a high gold. Maybe I'll, you know, sneak into the next tier kind of guy. Um, I'm decent, man. But I definitely like end up trying to slam like, you know, there's probably 20 good comps per season, right? And I get good at like four of them. So I think part of the reason why I can't break past the tiers is like if you try to force, you know, a comp and maybe someone else is running something similar, you know, the the real good players, they just they just see the board like 4D chess, right? I'm on a 2D plane just looking at tfttactics.gg and being like, okay, what are the S tier comps? Let me, uh, let me, let me set this up like that. It's just meant, it's just mental bandwidth, man. It's like, I, I got the crypto meta. I, I can't keep track of the TFT meta. I already got the league yeah. meta, right? It's just like, yeah, right. exactly. Like right now I'm running, I'm running bar two rage blades with a, with a hex tech gun blade. Just like, you know, it's great. It's yeah. Just meme it, meme it to victory. Meme it to victory. Um, <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, all right. So first question, man. Uh, main thing that Jacqueline and I love about you guys is you've been building on-chain games for years and you've gone through multiple different product iterations that you've shipped. So if we could just kick it off, you've seen the evolution of infrastructure in crypto and you've seen the crypto gaming infrastructure evolve. And then downstream of that is like, what are the limitations for what sort of logic we can put on chain? Downstream of that is what types of games can we create? So just high level. Curious, you know, like what are some of the like maybe the greatest hits of infra developments from Crypto Raiders to Midnight Heist that you feel has kind of enabled you to build the games that, that you want to build these days? Yeah, totally. I mean, like, you know, some of the biggest innovations, I think, is the stuff that's been happening on the, the user side in terms of wallets. So there's, of course, like ERC, what are they, 504s, which is like, you know, account, account abstraction through wallets. And then we're using Privy uh, and there's there's some competitors doing similar things with with embedded wallets. And that's been a huge innovation because like one of the clunkiest parts, anybody that does a lot of on-chain activity knows, it's like the, the 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 drag of like the MetaMask transactions and you know getting getting the gas right. And when we did our first playtest for Midnight Heist, we didn't have embedded wallets in place. 
And so people are like, no joke, hitting like 10, 15 MetaMask transactions for one game, right? It's just like, it's just the worst way. It's like, you know, you get them into the game experience. It's like, well, pop out, like hit a MetaMask transaction, right? And with these embedded wallets, uh, you can make a game feel completely like a game where there's there's no there's no kind of like fourth wall being broken per se by MetaMask transactions. And has it always been um, like primarily on the wallet side that you feel um, like innovation has happened? Like, is it primarily the like on the client side, right? Like we need to stop having users accept 10 to 15 different cookie notifications or MetaMask transactions in order to just play the game they want to play. Um, yeah. Or is, is it like, are there certain types of loops, like gameplay loops, right? Like clearly Crypto Raiders has is a certain kind of archetype. Um, yep. There's there's Midnight Heist. Uh, I think it was Cyber Stadium is the one that you guys launched in the middle. So yep. um, yeah, kind of curious, like your take on, hey, like clearly you guys were kind of limited by the state of the infrastructure in building Crypto Raiders. And I'm sure that influenced the game design. You know, yep. how has that kind of shifted? And then also, could you also maybe just talk briefly about, you know, what, what the impetus was behind shipping Cyber Stadium and how that influenced what you guys built with the following title? Yeah, totally. So so to answer that question first, with like Cyber Stadium, we wanted to kind of lay the foundation and, and get our feet wet with like a, our first like 100% fully on-chain experience. Crypto Raiders had a lot of on-chain elements and we were very early. So we were trying to push the envelope there with a lot of the... Uh, economy side being on chain, but like cyber stadium was our first pure play, like hundred percent on chain. And like our test for that is basically like, could you play it with a smart contract? Right. Or could you play it? You know how you can like read, write smart contract actions, right? Like if you can play the game entirely through like writing to the smart contract, then it's like hundred percent a fully on chain game. And so cyber stadium, what we wanted to do was kind of like figure out some things like, for example, matchmaking, right? So like, how do you randomly draw matches from a pool of people? Um, the other big thing is the combat engine itself, right? Because we have uh, the entire combat running in run one transaction. So you're trying to figure out how far you can push the envelope, how complex you can make the combat while keeping it in one transaction without hitting like gas limits, right? And that that was um, really important with Cyber Stadium. It got our feet, well, feet wet and helped us learn some things and allowed us to build Midnight Heist which also runs through one transaction for the combat, but like the depth is, you know, uh, greater by like a factor of, you know, 10. Um, so, so that was a, like a, a big stepping stone, I'd say for us to like get to where we are with Midnight Heist. Um, and, and now we have like, and, and we've solved a lot of the problems along the way, like in terms of um like how do you pull from VRF to get like, you know, proper randomized actions on chain? How do you like hide information on chain so that like other players don't know what other players are doing, right? And I'd, I'd say one of the biggest things with on-chain games that people are trying to figure out is, is how to speed things up, right? Because right now, a lot of this stuff is either asynchronous or like kind of slow for lack of a better word. I think one of uh, one game out there, fully on chain game, Sky Strife by Lattice, right? Really pushed the envelope in an interesting way where they made an RTS. And you're like, how do you do an RTS with like hidden information and all this stuff on chain? And they essentially put every batch of actions on like a 15 second clock, right? So you're basically submitting all of these actions and they're kind of all queuing up. And then every 15 seconds, they all process through, right? And when you're kind of just starting in the game, you only have a few actions, right? And you may be waiting a little bit on the timer, but by the, by the time you get to like the mid game or the late game, you have so many characters you're trying to move around, so many bases you're trying to like, you know, build units or upgrade that like you're, you're moving quick to get everything in through those 15 second clocks. And I thought that was like a really cool example of how with a fully on chain game, you can get this faster pace. So I guess you've spoken uh, a bit about like, the previous challenges, how those have slightly improved. And now there's obviously still some friction. Um, for you, what's like, what's top of mind when it comes to uh, the blockchain constraints on game design? Yeah, man, I mean, uh, I definitely the, the, like the file sizes, right? Or not the file sizes, but rather like the transaction sizes, right? Which is like how much you can like pack into a transaction. But like, I've had really interesting calls with the, uh, 
uh, Ava Labs team, right? Because it's it's not only that, right? Like one of the things that we're gonna see, because there's other ones out there, but like we're one of the first like fully on chain games that's really trying to ramp up, right? And what they've told me, but like shout out to like you know OGs like um, DeFi Kingdoms stuff like that, right? Because that's like a fully on chain game from 2021. One of the interesting things is, is that when your game is like when you have so much on chain activity and you're spitting out so many transactions, uh, essentially, eventually your ledger of record gets so long, right? Uh, because if you're if you're a fully on chain game, you want faster transactions and like faster transaction finality, right? That's why like, a lot of people are like on L threes, right? Where there's like you know the TPS is way higher, right? But the downside to that that means that your ledger of record is inflating at like, you know, 10 times the speed or a hundred times the speed of Ethereum. And so you fast forward that if you have a successful game, which we're planning on doing in multiple successful games, you eventually get to this thing where you start having to upgrade the nodes with like high end hardware, right? To, to be able to run. Um, but inherently by solving it, we may just be kicking the can down the road, right? And we just hit the, we hit the next constraint. Um, but once again, like I said previously, I think there's like some beauty in that in like working around um, uh, working around the constraints. And I think there's plenty of games that like fit perfectly for this kind of model without needing any other innovation. Right. And like that's why we're focused on like a lot of games in like the, the strategy front. Like, for example, something like Slay the Spire, which is like a roguelike. Right. Like the pacing of that game could work today fully on chain. Right. And that's like a beautiful thing. So. No, we can't do first person shooters right now, right? Or like a game like Dota isn't really realistic, but like a game like, you know, Magic the Gathering, 110% is realistic to be a fully on chain game. And I think that's like super exciting because I think we're going to see more of that kind of stuff um, be built. Built. Um, you're maybe not selling the dream. <laughs> <laughs> of uh of building fully on chain games it's which hard is, like fine i yeah. i appreciate the honesty um because yeah. it, it's real right um but uh i guess for anyone listening that uh is maybe skeptical or um doesn't follow the same kind of philosophical yeah interest um the question stands as to like is there a is there a good reason to kind of put yourself through this pain? Um, totally. And I don't know if you've if you've seen the light in any of the three games that you've uh, built so far, or if you're still building towards that that north star. So one is non custodial, meaning that like we're not custodying all these user funds like a centralized exchange, right? And then it's kind of like a black box, like. It, is enough funds in there? Or are they are they taking these funds and then like trying to get five percent interest on them, with like you know using Maker's DAO or something like that, right? Uh, it being non custodial, it's in your wallet the entire time, right? It's either in your wallet or it's in a smart contract as the tournament's running, and then it's paid out to the winners. We're never custodying anything, and when you look at some of the history of competitive online games, full tilt, Poker Stars, two massive online poker companies if you're stateside like me back when it was legal that's where you played on faux tilt was actually essentially revealed to be a ponzi scheme they didn't they were short on user funds right and like that's a massive trust issue when you think about that when you're when you're in these you know high stakes competitive games and there's lots of money going around like trusting that all of the money there is very very important and with fully on chain games being non-custodial and everybody's funds is sitting in their own respective wallets there's never a question of that. So that's one thing that just this game has solved for competitive online games. Um, the latter being like, is the information truly hidden, right? And I have two examples. One is from poker where it came out and it was revealed at a point in time that this, that this person, this new account just showed up in high stakes poker and just started running house, right? And all of these players that were losing against this like Anon player that just popped up on the scene at the high stakes level they finally compiled enough data on them and statistically proved that this person was cheating because they could not have been winning poker at that level. It was just mathematically impossible unless they knew all of their opponent's hands. The allegations, it was never fully proven, was that this person had God mode, right? Because where were all those poker hands stored on the server? If you had access to the server, you could see everybody's hands. Another example is on DraftKings or FanDuel, right? So when people are submitting lineups to these daily fantasy sports games, if you know what everyone else is submitting, 
right? So like if everybody is going um, Josh Allen, right? And no one's going Aaron Rodgers. Then if you pick Aaron Rodgers in your lineup and Aaron Rodgers does good, you have a massive advantage over everyone else in that tournament. Where's all of that information stored? On DraftKings and FanDuel servers. And back in 2014, it came out that DraftKings employees were looking at that data and then going to FanDuel and submitting lineups based off of that data. And one of the DraftKings employees won $300,000. And he had, he had a clear informational edge on the competition, right? The, the permissionless and the non-custodial and the trust factors, I think, are massive. And a lot of people, once again, they're like, why, why make it so hard for yourself? Why not just build Midnight Heist and just store it all on a server? Well, then, like, how, how do you know that everything's legit, right? When we, it's all on smart contracts. Anyone can audit it. Everyone can look at it. Um, and, and everyone's information is hidden. Once again, sometimes people, they don't download their plan and they're on their mobile phone. And they need to reveal for a lineup for a tournament. And they can't. And they're like, why, why can't you just reveal it for me? And it's like, dude, we don't know what you have, right? Like, it's like if you're sitting down at a poker table and you have pocket aces and you're so excited, you're nervous, you have to go to the bathroom and you take your cards with you. No one else at that table knows that you had pocket aces. They can't, they're not going to come back and be like, hey, man, you won. Here's all the money, right? Um, and so sometimes there's friction in that. But I think like those two things are like so fundamentally beautiful for competitive online games and yeah and then like to add to your point the like the, the end goal ideally right is you have the infra stack that people continue to build on top of one another so you have this rapid development uh cycle that kind of you know in the yeah. game screen goes up it, as exactly as yeah and it's like super replay. powerful with like lattice like it, the fact that ccp like a massively successful studio is like building their on-chain game with Lattice's InfraStack. Like, shout out to those guys for closing that deal. That's massive. But yeah, that's like a perfect example where like CCP is like, are we going to build all of this tooling ourselves, right? Or just rent or lease or, you know, enter a SaaS contract with this company to use all of their tech and like save us six months or a year with proven technology. Like that that stuff starts to compound on top of each other, right? And I think, I think the next three years is going to be faster than people think. And you brought up um, you brought up this concept of like, hey, for an on-chain game with the economy, right? That's that may have more implications than a game that you know maybe is has dedicated servers, right? So I'm curious, like, do you think the durability of an on-chain game is directly tied to kind of like how robust that underlying economy is? Just to like kind of play this fact pattern out, it's like if the idea is composability, then where does all that composability kind of funnel back down to? Um, I guess some people have argued that it is that that in-game economy. Um, I'm curious if, if you agree with that. I mean, obviously with the game, you have to find the fun, right? Like uh, that's kind of the, the assumption here, but I'm curious if you have- Totally, but I, I think what you're saying is, is like, can like a powerful, robust economy that grows, like almost create like an embedded effect or like a, like a, like a, like a built-in value effect that makes it like have way more lasting power. And I think that that, can be very true. I think like when we look at like, I, I played a crap ton of World of Warcraft like growing up, right? And like when you think of like that kind of innovation in MMORPGs and then like how have they been the king for such a long period of time in that genre? And I mean, people have thrown hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to like usurp them, right? But like, are they almost unbeatable in sense because of this embedded, you know, network effect and then this accrued value, right? Where people have, uh, characters and attachments and they're in a guild and they're on a certain server, right? And all of these things create friction to like move off of something else. That's why I definitely think that there's going to be like probably like two or three winners in like kind of the autonomous world economic powerhouse type of like fully on chain game, right? I think the Uniswap example is a good one. Like you're either having, uh, it's either the economic primitive that just continues to get forked um yep. and used in different games or it's uh ip 100 um it'll be open permissionless transparent and uh there'll be like no upside for the for the founding team um except like clout but it will be awesome um, like for example someone could come and they could fork midnight heist code right and like build their own version of midnight heist um Right now, luckily, like it's just not a 
with where the on-chain state is is at, they would they would essentially have to build their own blockchain, whether it's an AVAX subnet or like an L3, to get the cost down to be able to make it work. But and yeah, that's why I like like what we're doing in, in these like fully on chain things where like everything's there and transparent. I also think it's great for the user because I think one thing that's really going to start to evolve with fully on chain games is you're going to be able to like quantifiably see like, okay, this person in this fully on chain game was like a massive whale powerhouse, right? Like big mover in that space. Now, if you want to go acquire that customer for your own on chain game, like the player kind of gets all of the reward of their data living on chain, right? So like you may say, hey, it'd be worth for us to spend $500 to acquire this person. So we're going to give them $500 of like stuff in our game to get them to come over and start playing our game, right? And instead of all of this data kind of being stored by these big tech companies and then resold off a million different times, right? Where the user doesn't own their data. That's the other benefit of fully on-chain games is like the user or the wallet or whatever you want to call it, like kind of controls their own data. And through that, I think when you see how user acquisition plays out. Cause I mean, we've even been looking at it for like scaling up midnight heights. Like we, we can see on chain activity. We can see all of the top players of other games that we think are a strong fit to our game. Um, now reaching out to them, isn't the easiest thing. Hopefully their name matches a name on Twitter, right? And you can cold DM them or something like that. Right. Like messaging on chain isn't great. Although, you know, yeah, you send them an NFT, right? You can send them an NFT. Hey, man, email me. I got 500 bucks of Midnight Heist tickets for you. You know, come Rug. and play. But Rug. that is a powerful thing for the users too, right? It's kind of like owning your data and your history. Um, well, I think that just about wraps it up for uh, this episode. Um, thanks, Kicks. It's been a pleasure. Absolute uh, pleasure. We've had, yeah, man, it's been fun. Um, yeah, I hope to see you again on the pod soon. Yeah, would love to come on again. Thanks for having me. The content of this video is intended for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views shared by Alex and I are our own and we may hold investments in some of the companies or digital assets featured in the video.